Okay, great. We're going to begin with a couple housekeeping items. I know this might be old hat for most of you. Um, so I'll go through them really quickly. You are muted, but you have the ability to unmute yourself. You're welcome to ask a question at any time using the chat function. I think Sam is going to um, be doing some interactive um, things with you and we're going to have a Q&A portion at the end. So feel free, whatever um, pops into your mind, go ahead and ask that question in the chat. And this presentation is being recorded. So a link to the event recording will be emailed to you afterwards. And you can also visit our video archive at that link there, um, which will be emailed to you as well. Um, and we have a whole vault of um, past recordings from our events that you can feel free to check out. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our presenter today. Samantha Schwartz, or Sam, graduated from Washington State University in 2015 with a degree in wine business management. After graduating, she was appointed as brand manager at one of Washington State's top wineries. In 2019, she made the shift into real estate and began flipping houses. Last year, Samantha expanded her services into advising others in the purchase and sale of their home as a realtor. Her background in flipping houses gives her the ability to advise clients beyond a transaction with great knowledge of the construction process and strong insight onto how to make a great investment. So without further ado, Sam, take it away. All right, thank you, Amber, for the introduction. I am so grateful to be here with all of you today. So thank you for taking the time out of your day to tune in and listen. And I'm so excited to share everything I've learned over the last several years. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen here and get started. So Home Ownership 101. What will we be covering today? So a little introduction, current market conditions, renting versus buying, preparing to buy, the steps to buying a home, what it takes to write a competitive offer, the value of buying now, what making a great investment looks like, buyer advice, and here we go. So um, Amber went over a little bit of my background, um, just some reference and photos to get started. The photos over here on the right are the first house that I flipped back in 2019. I purchased the house in May and for $305,000 and it was in complete disarray. We ended up tearing out all the walls, doing new electrical, plumbing, sheetrock, um, re-sided, re-roofed, um, painted everything, landscaping, complete kitchen remodel, bathroom, turned the garage into a rental unit out back. And when it was all said and done, sold it for $610,000. And from there, I went on to flip a handful of other homes and then ended up pivoting into acting as a realtor um, after having friends and family reach out for advice on their own transactions and realized with my hospitality background that I really love um, being able to educate and advise in that way. So this past year, I joined a team with Relogic Sotheby's, um, these three women pictured on the left. Um, between the four of us, we have over 20 years of experience and have done around 400 million in sales. And being able to help clients in this way of having a bunch of um, different areas um, of experience, being able to have feet on the ground at all times, and being able to really educate on what it takes to get an offer accepted in this market because it is no easy feat. So what is the market really like right now? Today's mortgage rates have risen from where they were a couple months ago, but they're still very low. They're hovering around 3%. So to give you a historic idea of what that means, so last year in 2020, rates averaged around 3.1%. In 2019, they averaged around 394 In 2018, they were around 4.54%. So historically, still very low right now in comparison to where we've been in the past. 
Inventory of March of 2021 was just over a million units nationwide. This is a extreme shortage in supply. Typically, they're around two to three million units nationwide. So with that, we are leading to an inflation in price. The National Association of Realtors published an article article recently stating that the medium existing home price for all housing types in April was $341,600, which is up 19.1% from April of 2020. And this was recorded across every region as a price increase. I get a lot of questions of, are we in a bubble right now? Am I gonna buy now? And then is it gonna completely tank? And with everything that I've been reading and from my experience and all of the experts which I consult with, we are in a completely different situation than 13 years ago when we had the foreclosure crisis where the um, mortgage lenders were giving out loans to pretty much anything you could put zero down. They weren't doing um, as much of a background check as they are today. So when the market and economy went down, the housing market then crashed um, because people weren't able to keep up. And what we're facing today is completely different. It's more of an issue of supply and demand. So is there hope for more supply? And the answer is, I don't have a crystal ball, but from everything that I've been reading and seeing, I believe the answer is yes. With more um, with COVID-19 vaccinations rolling out, uh, more inventory is anticipated as more people feel comfortable listing their homes and having people within them. That's been one of the bigger issues is people don't want other people in their houses. And if they sell their home, then where is their, where are they going to move? So having a little bit more flexibility with that. And then the falling number of homeowners and mortgage forbearance will also bring about more inventory. And then finally, the National Association of Realtors um, has been working with the Biden administration to decrease tariffs on lumber, loosen permitting regulations, increase construction workers, and hopefully offer capital gains tax reductions for investors. So moving into renting versus buying, I'd like to take a quick poll here just to get an idea of where everyone's at in their life. If you feel comfortable, I would love for you to enter in the chat box if you are currently renting or own. So just type in rent or own and can take a quick poll of that and see where um, everyone's at in their life. So have a pretty good mix in here. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. So to be quite frank, renting and buying, buying isn't for everyone. So I think the first step is to take an honest look at where you're at in your life, what your long-term goals are, um, what you have saved, um, what you want out of your life. And then from there, consider buying. So there are benefits to renting, um, one of which is liquid assets. So let's say you have $50,000 in your savings right now and you want to buy a home and you want to put 20% down and that 20% down is $50,000. So with that, all of your money is then going into that home. Whereas if you're renting, you still have that $50,000 liquid. You could take a trip to Jamaica. You could buy those pair of shoes. You could do whatever you want with it. You have a little bit more freedom with your assets. And then with that too, freedom to be mobile. So you could be living in Seattle today and then move to Maui next month, um, depending on your lease agreement, you have freedom to move. And then you're not responsible for maintenance. So if you're renting and your fridge goes out, you're able to call your landlord and he will be responsible for switching that out for you. Whereas if you're a homeowner, you have to run to Home Depot and pick out a fridge and bring it home. So a little bit more responsibility on you. And then finally, no property tax bill. So what are the benefits of buying? So no mortgage increase. So with rent, your rent can rise each year, every couple of years. With a mortgage, once you lock in your rate, that is for the full term of your loan, unless you decide that you want to refinance. 
which I won't be going into that in full today, but a lot of people refinanced this last year because rates have been so low. And then next appreciation. So if you buy a home today, in theory, it should appreciate over time. Stability for if you love a specific neighborhood and you know that's where you wanna end up. If you're considering having a family and you want your kids in one set school district and one set school, you have this ability of knowing that there's not gonna be any change there. You can improve and upgrade to your taste. So if you're renting and you hate your kitchen counters, you're kind of stuck with them. Whereas if you own, you can change out whatever you'd like and make it up to your taste and then add value in that as well by making those updates. And then save money on tax deductions. So with that, there are a couple different layers to it. One I'll get into. So let's say you buy a home, it's been a year and you bought the home for $400,000. And now it is worth $500,000 because there has been a massive appreciation in value. You go to sell your home for the first year, you get a $125,000 tax break. So you aren't taxed on that amount of the increase in value. So that's tax-free money. And then after two years, that goes up to $250,000. And if you're married, that goes up to $500,000 for that second year. So there are major tax um, advantages with that. And then this chart published by the National Association of Realtors is super helpful too. Um, the chart shows a cost comparison for a renter and a homeowner over a seven year period. The renter starts out paying $800 per month with an annual increase of 5%. The homeowner purchases a home for $110,000 and pays a monthly mortgage rate of $1,000. After six years, the homeowner payment is lower than the renter's monthly payment. With tax savings of homeownership, the homeowner's payment is less than the rental payment after three years. So this is taking into account that there is typically um, a rental increase, but your mortgage payment stays the same. And then this breaks down with the monthly differences. And this shows an idea of what tax savings could be and then the combined yearly difference in after tax savings. And I love real world examples. So my company, Realogic Sotheby's, just published this article um, as a tax deduction case study for downtown Seattle. So typical rents averaged around $1,241,000 in 2010, but soared 84% to average around $2,230 by 2020. Residents that rented newly built apartments paid 50 million in rent over the last decade. Based on the medium household income of 114,000, the typical condominium owner will receive an annual income tax savings of approximately $9,228,000, not including capital appreciation. Renters miss out on an average of $8,244,000 per year or approximately $82,400 in a collective income tax deductions over the past decade. So it shows you how, I mean, that's the first number is no number to scoff at, but it really shows you um, how that savings builds over time. The average price of, for a condominium in 2010 was $524,842 hundred dollars, but swelled to eight hundred and thirteen thousand seven hundred and seventy six hundred in twenty twenty. Typical condominiums appreciated fifty five percent in the last decade or on average five point five percent per year. Renters of new apartments typically paid out two hundred eighteen thousand nine hundred and eighty three hundred in the last decade, while condominium owners of a similar housing gained on average two hundred eighty eight hundred thousand nine hundred and thirty four hundred dollars in capital appreciation. So this is just specific to one market and every market is different, but it gives you an idea of kind of the long-term ramifications and benefits of owning over renting. With that said, these numbers don't apply to every neighborhood. If 
you bought in an area that didn't go up in value, then um, there might be some differences here. Or um, if you were in a different tax bracket, there could be some discrepancies as well. But this is just um, one specific scenario to give you an idea. So there are a ton of fantastic calculators out there that can help you go over, is it better to rent or buy, which I have an example of here, how much do you need to have saved to buy a home, what could be your budget, and I think those are great first steps to give you an idea of what you can buy with um, what you have saved or what you should plan to save for. I think some of my, one of my favorite calculators is on freddymac.com. I have the link down below. And this is um, just a brief overview. Um, there are some other factors that go into creating this chart that I don't have listed, but just wanted to keep it relatively simple for the sake of today and just getting the point across. So let's say you're renting a two bedroom condo right now in Seattle and it's um, $2,200. Your renter's insurance is $16 per month and your yearly rent increase is 5%. And then let's say you wanna purchase a home and it's 600,000, you're putting 15% down. Your property tax is $3,250 per year. Your home insurance policy is $1,000 per year and your estimating around $700 maintenance for little things that might come up. Based off of these numbers and a couple other little factors that I didn't include in, you will save $77,997 by buying instead of renting over five years. So I think another important thing to take into consideration here is thinking ahead and recognizing that sometimes if you want to just buy something for the short term, it can not be the best investment. Um, it can be, but really taking that into consideration because a lot of times it isn't until the third, fourth, fifth year that you start to see um, the real value in buying over renting. So preparing to buy, what are some of the things that you could be doing today? So budget for your total expenses. So how much are you going to need to have saved to buy a home? And we'll go over that in a little more detail um, coming up here shortly, but there's also great calculators for that um, on Freddie Mac, for instance. And then establish and maintain good credit. So start to build your credit history, open a free and low cost checking and savings account, apply for a credit card and use it responsibly and then make a spending and savings plan. Make all your payments on time, monitor credit by checking your credit report annually. Um, starting to really evaluate how much you're spending versus saving every month and what you need to do to get to your long-term goal of buying. What expenses should you plan for? So there are some other little additional things in here, but these are the big ones. So number one, down payment is typically zero to 20% of the purchase price, depending on the loan terms. So 0% is if you are a veteran, um, that's a, unheard of now um, for anyone other than that, but you can put anywhere from three to 20% down. Anything under 20% though, then there is private mortgage insurance, which I won't go into detail today, but if you have questions on that, I'd be more than happy to answer that later. Earnest money is typically one to 5% of the purchase price. And this amount that you're putting down, so after your offer is accepted, earnest money is your good faith to the seller that you are going to carry through with the transaction. And this money that you're putting down now is then applied to your closing costs um, or the price of your loan um, at closing. This isn't money that you're giving to the seller, it's just, your goodwill um, that you're going to follow through. The next is a home inspection. That's approximately $400 for a single family home. And we'll go over what that means later. An appraisal, approximately $800 and is usually paid when you close on the home. We'll go over what that is later as well. And then closing costs is usually two to 3% of the purchase price. And there are a handful 
plus of things that go into making up that price. And um, if you have questions on that, I won't be covering that in detail today, but would be more than happy to send you more information on that later. So what are the steps to buying a home? Number one, meet with your realtor and create a wish list. Two, get pre-approved with your mortgage lender. Three, begin your home search. Four, offer negotiations. Five, offer accepted, open escrow, earnest money. Six, inspection and appraisal. Seven, closing. And now we're gonna go into all of those um, in greater detail here. So what do you need to look for when selecting a realtor? And the first thing is qualifications. Have they assisted other clients before? What was their training and education? Where do they have their license hung? Is there support there? Um, and then availability. Are they going to be able to get you into a home the day or the next day after something is listed? Um, in this market, things are moving so incredibly fast that you really need feet on the ground the moment something's listed or else you could lose out. Communication, making sure that you are with someone that is going to clearly communicate with you and be there for you when you need them and making sure that your communication styles go well together. Service offered. So there's a lot of things that go into this, but I think one of the biggest things is, let's say you find a home you love and it's selling for $500,000. How do you know if that's a reasonable price? So what we can do is go in and pull a comparable market analysis. And what that does is we look within typically a 0.25 parameter search of the home. And then within the price range, within the age that it was built, similar square footage, similar bedrooms, bathrooms. And then we compare the price that that sold in relation to what the home you love is being offered at to make sure that you are paying a reasonable price for that. And then finally, testimonials. What have their clients said about them in the past? Have they had a great experience? Um, is there anything that they wish they could have changed? Making sure that you know before you get involved what you're getting yourself into fully. And then next step is selecting a lender. So I have a lot more questions that I would ask other than this, but I think these are some of the best ones just to get your wheels turning. What will be my interest rate and annual percentage rate? There is a, um, a difference from lender to lender of what interest rates people offer. What cost will I be paying at closing? What loan product do you recommend given my scenario? What can I do to move the process forward to ensure that I am fully underwritten other prior to extending an offer? What are you projecting in terms of interest rates going forward? How often will I be updated on the loan's progress? In this market, having a good realtor and a good lender are two of the best first steps you can make. It can make all the difference in being able to win a home. In addition to this, making sure that you get a lender that's able to not only close on time, but has the option to close early. I have one offers just because I had a 20-day close instead of a 30-day close, and not every lender is able to do that. So making sure that if you are located in Seattle or San Francisco or a really competitive market, that you are working with a lender that is able to get an appraiser out right away and close earlier on time. So once you decide on your lender, the next step is getting pre-approved. And what a pre-approval is essentially is one, there to help you set your budget. There's a lot of great online tools that you can use to assess how much of a house you can buy. But I think the best step is to work with a mortgage lender and really get a clear expectation of what you are able to afford. And then with this too, in today's market, you almost need a pre-approval included with your offer in order to get your offer accepted, because this gives the seller assurance that you are qualified to make the offer. And then what's listed here is just an outline of some of the things that you need in order to get pre-approved. So one month, most recent pay steps, two years of W-2s, 
two years of personal tax returns, two months asset statements, a lease agreement for all rental properties, monthly mortgage statements, and then your driver's license to prove your identity. Now on to the fun steps once you got that figured out. So defining where you want to look for a home and what you're looking for is so incredibly important so that your realtor is able to help you to the best of their ability find a home that meets your needs. So I think the first thing is looking out and seeing what neighborhoods you're open to. And in this market, I recommend if your heart is set on one neighborhood, being open to at least a couple other that could be a reasonable option. Sometimes if you get stuck to someone neighborhood, it can be a little challenging to win the home. So for instance, if you're in Seattle, if you love this neighborhood called Green Lake, maybe considering Maple Leaf or Finney Ridge or just those neighborhoods that are surrounding it, because that could make all the difference in you finding the home you love. And then the next step is deciding what type of home you're looking for. Are you looking for a single family home? Are you looking for a town home? Are you looking for a condo, a duplex? Are you looking for raw land to build on? And then style, are you looking for something that's mid-century modern, colonial, really kind of defining if that matters to you, what type of style you want. And for a lot of people, they don't necessarily care about that, but if it is something you care about, then getting that out there from the beginning. The age of the home, maybe you want something newer so you don't have to deal with the potential headaches of old electrical plumbing foundation. And then are there features that are a necessity to you? And one thing I always love to ask are, what are the top five things you need in a home? And with that, I would love to have everyone type in the chat, what is the number one thing that you would love in a home? Or if you currently own, what is the number one thing that you love about your home? Because I always think that's interesting to see where people's um, taste lies and what they look for. So if you're willing to share, I would love to hear what you have to say. And I'll give a moment for that. Kitchen, high ceiling, updated kitchen, open floor plan, huge windows, lots of light, same here. Brand new house, nice, vaulted ceilings, beautiful. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Favorite part is a kitchen and lots of light. Open floor plan, master bathroom, walk-in closet, yes. Lots of living space, room to spread out, large backyard, equity. These are all great answers. Two zones for heating and cooling, up and down stairs, saves money, open floor plan. Nice. I like the way you think, Taylor. All right, get back to it. So now we've gone through the home search process and you found the home you love and it's time to submit an offer. So for every state, the purchase and sale agreement might look a little different, but in Washington state, this is an example of what the first page of a purchase and sale agreement looks like. So you have your date, um, offer expiration date, buyer, seller, property, the items that will be included. What are you offering? The amount of earnest money you're putting down. Are you gonna write a check, a note, a wire? Typically in Seattle and Washington, it's a two days after mutual acceptance, you put, you have to deliver your earnest money. Um, if you aren't able to follow through with the deal and you lose your earnest money, do you forfeit your earnest money or does the seller have the option to sue you? <laughs> um, who's your title and closing agent? closing date. So just some general things. And then beyond this initial first page, um, some of the things that the agreement includes is how you intend to finance the home. So are you going to be working with a lender? Are you going to be getting a conventional loan? Are you going to be getting an FHA loan? Are you going to get a VA loan? The amount of earnest money you're going to be putting down. So for earnest money, um, what this is, is like I said before, showing the seller that you are committed and motivated to following through with the deal. The more month, earnest money you put down, it's usually one to 5%, but the more you put down um, shows the seller how committed you are to the transaction. 
who will pay the closing costs. So in today's market, it's almost always the buyer that's paying the closing costs. I had one deal recently where I was able to negotiate um, the seller to pay the closing costs and put in a new washer and dryer. But with how competitive things have been, that's almost unheard of. Um, what inspections will be performed? And that can be, um, we'll go over that in greater detail, but are you going to have a professional certified inspector come out? Are you going to have a sewer scope? Um, any repairs you'd like done. So if you do an inspection and then you'd like the seller to perform, um, prepare, um, for, do anything, that's there. Um, if any personal property is included, which we have here, the date of possession, and then the terms of cancellation. And then moving into contingencies. So submitting an offer. Um, in today's market, we are not really providing that many contingencies. And what contingencies are, are protection for the buyer. This is your ability to get out of the deal and still keep your earnest money. So in a typical market, in some transactions now, we have the following contingencies outlined. And you are able to get out of a deal for any reason for any of these. So for financing, this is stating that to the best of you, this is you applying for the loan. And if for any reason your loan falls through to the best of your ability in order to follow through with it, um, if that doesn't work out, then you're able to get out of the deal and get your earnest money back. Appraisal, we're gonna be going into what that means here in a moment, so I won't go in depth there. Same for inspection. Title review. So when you um, are looking at a house and you put an offer, you will get a preliminary title report. And what this does either shows you that there is clear title and you are good to move forward, or if there are any encumbrances. So an example of that could be, let's say Bob and Sue own a house and they had their cousin Joe buy the home with them. And Bob and Sue are now selling the home now, but Joe has no idea. So they don't have legal right to sell the home without his approval. So there can be situations like that. Or if there's a lien on the property, the title report will give you an idea um, if it's clear and marketable title. Neighborhood review period. So this is your opportunity to check out the neighborhood, make sure that you're okay with the schools, that there's no sexual predators, that um, you feel safe, um, whatever it may be, um, just that you feel good um, living in that neighborhood. And then a home sale. So let's say you currently own and you are purchasing the next home contingent on your ability to sell your home. And these are um, the primary contingencies that you'll see. So what is an inspection and appraisal? So an inspection, a home inspector researches a property and acquires a written report that details its condition, including an assessment of necessary or recommended repairs, maintenance concerns, and any other potentially costly issues. The home inspector will assess the physical structure of the home from the foundation to the roof, as well as home systems. This assessment will determine if the home is up to code. An inspection is so incredibly important. Um, this could be the difference in, let's say you fall in love with the home, but it needs a new roof and new windows and new electrical and plumbing. You could be in the whole $100,000 and having to make those repairs. So this is so important to know upfront what you're getting yourself into. An appraisal is an estimation of a home's current market value. A licensed appraiser completes this estimation, which is calculated by comparing the recent sales of homes in an area as to the property that is being appraised. This is required by mortgage lenders to be sure that money they are lending to a new homeowner or a current homeowner is a fair amount for the home. So we've kind of gone over a couple of these things, but I think it's important to give you a clear idea um, outlined. Once you purchase the home, what are the next, the final steps? So escrow is open, earnest money is due. You just have to decide on your lender if you hadn't already. 
satisfy and remove all contingencies, prepare finances for closing and down payment, schedule your move, close your home, and then transfer utilities to your name. So what goes into writing a competitive offer? So in today's market, it's not just about price. There are a lot of other factors that go into it. So obviously highest price always sounds great. So if a home selling for 400,000 and you put in an offer for 600,000, that will obviously make your offer look great. Today, we're seeing a lot of pre-inspections. So I always advise my clients that to do their own inspection. And if it's going to be a situation where there's multiple offers, you almost always need to do a pre-inspection so that you are able to waive your inspection. A lot of people aren't willing to expect, accept inspection contingencies because one, that can lead to the deal falling through. And two, that could lead to the buyer trying to negotiate the price down. So by performing a pre-inspection, it makes your offer look more desirable, stating that I know exactly what I'm getting myself into. I'm okay with any repairs that need to be made. I have enough money to cover the ones that need immediate action, and I'm moving forward. So waiving contingencies. So one of those contingencies is the inspection. Um, waiving financing, waiving the appraisal. And that is something to consult with your agent with because waiving contingencies is not for everyone. It really depends on a case-by-case -case situation. And if you're in the financial situation to be able to do that, if you don't have that much savings waive, or you're self-employed, waiving financing can be a horrible idea and put yourself into a bad situation. And same for waiving your appraisal. If a home is listed at 500,000, but everything in the neighborhood has been selling at 250, you could be in a really bad situation with having to make up that difference. So really this falls into the value of working with a realtor that has experience and is able to really advocate and educate you. Early closing. So this goes back to what I mentioned before about the lender. Sometimes it makes a huge difference to the seller being able to close right away. So maybe offering a 20-day close could be the difference that your offer is accepted over something that's doing a traditional 30-day close. And then writing in a love letter. So what this is, is a letter to the sellers um, introducing yourself, telling your story, and writing about what you love about the home. This can make a huge difference if it's um, someone that cares about who moves into their home next. Early release of earnest money. So typically earnest money is released to the seller or is released at the end of the transaction. Earnest money is put towards, so it's the money you put down at the beginning and then it's put towards your closing costs. However, an early release of earnest money is your assurance that you feel good about it can be released at many different times, but it's your um, confidence that the deal is going to move through and you have no concerns. For instance, I um, just wrote up an offer today where I'm doing an early release of earnest money, but I am not sure if the home is going to appraise. So I am doing an early release after the appraisal. So that will give the buyers assurance and confidence that everything is good before the earnest money is um, released. So kind of going back to, are we in a bubble? Is right now a good time to buy? Are things so expensive right now? Things are appreciating. Um, I think that is one of the biggest questions I'm asked. So I think this is a really great example to just to give you an idea um, and kind of get your wheels turning. So let's take a house that's valued at $325,000. If a buyer makes a 10% down payment, $32,500, they'll end up borrowing $992,500 for their mortgage. Applying the projected rate of home price appreciation, the same house will cost $350,025 next year. 
with a 10% down payment of $35,003. They then have to borrow $315,022. Therefore, as a result of rising home prices alone, a prospective buyer will have to put down an additional $2,503 and borrow an additional $22,523 just for waiting a year to make their move. So in I, like I said, I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know where the market's going, but it kind of gives you an idea of no matter what things are appreciating. So there is a value in buying when you can rather than waiting for um, better days. And then home appreciation factors. So what goes into a home appreciating and value after you purchase it? So number one is supply and demand. And that's what we're seeing right now in this market with um, the escalations in price. Right now, supply is extremely low, as I mentioned earlier, and demand is very high. So that is leading to great appreciation in home prices. Next is comparable sales. So let's say your neighbor, you bought your house for $500,000 last year and your neighbor who has a very similar home um, is now selling their home for 550. Your home went up $50,000 in value. So that is a big indicator of um, how your home is appreciated is recent sales um, in your neighborhood. Job markets. So let's say, um, giving Washington examples right now, for instance, Tacoma. Tacoma is booming right now. There's a lot of um, tech companies that are moving in there, a lot more jobs moving in. So there is um, more people moving there and the demand for housing there is going up. Population growth. And that's one thing we're really seeing in Seattle with Amazon and all of the people that are moving in. Um, with more population, there's more demand for housing. Cost of borrowing. So right now, the cost to borrow is cheap around 3%. So that is increasing appreciation of home value um, and demand. School district. So data from the National Association of Realtors revealed that 26% of recent home buyers were influenced by the quality of their school district when selecting a neighborhood. So school district is a huge thing to look for um, in terms of your home holding its value over time if you're buying a single family home or a home that's more targeted towards families. Next is zoning regulations. So let's say you're currently in a neighborhood that's zoned for just single family homes, but they're now allowing new construction for townhomes. So you have an old house that was built in the 1900s that is dilapidated and kind of falling apart. The average person might not want to buy that to then have to renovate and take the risk and liabilities associated with that. But if you're in a neighborhood that has been upzoned to now allow townhomes, a builder would love that home because they can tear it down and they can build townhomes. So that then increases the value with the change in zoning regulations new commercial businesses. So giving another Washington, Seattle example, there's a neighborhood here called South Park. And for the longest time, um, it didn't have as much draw as it does now. There's been a ton of really great businesses and restaurants and wine shops and coffee shops that have gone in there recently. And it's um, created a different environment and people are now flocking there and home prices there have um, gone up exponentially proximity to nature. So a research um, by University of Washington suggests that homes adjacent to parks and open spaces hold eight to 20% higher value than comparable properties. Usable square footage. So let's say you bought a house with an unfinished basement or an attic that had high ceilings. If you convert that into usable square footage, putting in an extra bedroom or bathroom, um, that can really appreciate the value of the home. Renovations and updates. Um, renovations magazine reports that a minor kitchen remodel adds on average $18,206,000 in resale value. 
recouping 77.6% of the project cost. Um, we'll go into a little bit more of that, but cosmetic updates like that can really make the difference in you getting top dollar for your home. So remodeling your kitchen, remodeling your bathroom, putting fresh paint in, just making it look bright and clean can make a huge difference in your ability to get top dollar. And then curb appeal. So updating your landscaping, putting in some shrubs, painting your exterior, cleaning your roof, all of that can appreciate the value of your home. So home appreciation study. This is one of the houses I flipped. And you can see some before and after pictures. Um, we purchased this at $300,000. We invested $80,000 into it. Um, a roof, new flooring, refinished hardwoods, interior paint, countertops, landscaping, completed garage. And these were all just very, very easy cosmetic updates. And it only took um, two months to do all of this. And we listed it at 509,000 and ended up selling it for 525. So just the value of making something look clean is massive. And then this is just a um, random house to give you an idea. So this is in the Maple Leaf neighborhood in Seattle. This home sold in January of 2013 for $339,950,000. $950, and they did not make any updates to it. So what they did, what they bought it for in 2013 is the exact same. They rented it out in 2018 for several years, and now they're selling it for $699,500. I can't, didn't say that right. Anyways, massive increase in value just from holding on to it and investing in a neighborhood that has gone up exponentially in value. So advice for buyers in this market. I think the number one biggest thing you can do is get pre-approved and know your budget. And then with that, search with the market in mind. So let's say you're pre-approved up to $700,000, but you're recognizing in the area that you're looking in that things are escalating $50,000 over list price. So it would be wise to look for homes up to 650,000 so that you're able to go up in price. Two are unexpected neighborhoods. So looking into neighborhoods surrounding what your dream is, making sure that you're not leaving any corner unturned and you're being open-minded. Make it easy for the seller. So waiving contingencies, having a clean offer, um, making sure that your realtor is submitting just a really nicely formatted offer. Start with your strongest offer. So I always recommend putting your best foot forward and stretching to the point that you feel comfortable because you don't want to end up losing for a couple thousand dollars um, if you're able to go a little bit higher if it's your dream home. And then finally, reach out to me. Here is my um, email and phone number and um, Instagram handle. So please connect. I would love to um, be in touch with all of you. If you have any questions beyond what I went over today, um, this was just a general overview, but I would be more than happy to offer one-on-one -on -one consults to go over um, what your specific situation is, what some advice, um, taking the time to do that. And then I also just put together a really helpful first time home buyers workbook um, that can help you prepare and kind of go over some frequently asked questions, um, kind of a synopsis of what we did today. If you would like to receive that, I would love it if you would type your email address in the chat box and I can send that over today. And if not, Amber can send it over um, and follow up too. And then thank you for coming. We have a little bit of time left. So if there are any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or um, type it in the chat box and I'll do my best to answer anything. 
But thank you all so much for showing up today. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Kim, for making this happen. I am so grateful for the opportunity to be here. Go Cougs and thanks. Of course, thank you so much, Sam. So yeah, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat. We have a couple minutes. I have one to start us off. Um, so I know that um, when you buy a car and you drive it off the lot, automatically depreciates in value, right? So wrapping my, wrapping my head around the fact that when you buy a home, it does the opposite is kind of difficult. Do homes always appreciate in value regardless of if you don't do anything or do you need to kind of do like those factors that you listed? Something needs to happen to make it appreciate in value. Something needs to happen to happen. It, that's not always the case. So let's say you buy a home that was built in 1915 and the foundation is falling apart, the roof is caving in, the electrical and plumbing's old, but like you're able to kind of make it work. And over time, that's going to depreciate because it's not going to be livable. So that's an instance where appreciation doesn't always apply. And then let's say you bought in a neighborhood that was super trendy and cool and then something happened in that neighborhood and now no one wants to live there. That can cause the home not to go up in value. But so it's really important to work with a realtor and making sure that you understand um, the intricacies of every neighborhood because um, every neighborhood is different. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much. Any other questions? I have a question. So when you are looking to either sell your house or maybe like use it as a rental property, what are some pieces of advice that you give for that? Just looking at like the market, if you have a new house, like how do you know when is the right time to sell your house or is there a right time to sell your house, I guess? So I think the first step is reaching out to a realtor and having them pull a comparative market analysis for you. And what that will do is give you an idea of what things are selling for in your neighborhood. So then you can compare, okay, I bought it for X and now I could sell it for Y. Does that make sense for me? Or for, let's say for instance, this year in Seattle, if you bought a condo downtown Seattle a year ago, and then you're like, oh, I don't want to live in Seattle with everything that's happened this year with the riots and everything. I want to move. In that instance, because the demand for downtown Seattle for probably eight months was pretty low, it's going back up now significantly. If you were to sell in that period, you would lose money. So the better option there would be to rent it out until the market took a turn and your property was more desirable. But then let's say, you bought a home in Kirkland, Washington, or on the east side of Seattle, which has been extremely competitive lately. And you bought that a year ago, and now it's you bought it for eight hundred thousand, and now it's worth one point three million dollars. You would want to sell it if you wanted to. You wouldn't want to hold on to it to rent because um, you could get a lot more for it. So I think the best thing you do is work with a realtor, have that comparative market analysis, and really weigh the pros and cons and analyze what's going on with your neighborhood right now. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Any other questions? Last call. And then also just wanted to throw it out there. Um, with my office, I have agents all over the U.S. and all over the world. And if you're in the market and you're not looking in Seattle and Washington and you don't know where to start and you need help finding someone, I'd be more than happy to um, help interview and find the right person for you so that you're finding someone that will advocate for you and do take the time to do the CMAs and make sure that you're making the right investment for you because that can really make or break um, your ability to build wealth through real estate. Perfect. 